Thanks to Linode Cloud Computing for supporting this episode of SciShow. You can go to linode.com slash scishow to learn more and get a $100 60-day credit on a new Linode account. <music> Cows are incredible. Their burps control the weather, they can eat grass, and we can eat them. But their weather-controlling burps can become a problem. So here's Hank to explain how we're solving it. When you think about stuff that contributes to climate change, you might picture huge smokestacks or traffic in Los Angeles or something that generally looks dirty. But how about a huge field full of big-eyed, adorable grazing cows? It might sound a little silly, but when you get enough cows in one place, they burp and exhale a lot of methane, a greenhouse gas even better at trapping heat than carbon dioxide. In fact, if cows were a country, that nation would be one of the biggest methane producers in the world, if not the biggest. One way to reduce this is to just eat less meat and dairy, and there will be fewer cows created. But while that is a great option, it's not likely that most people will go vegan anytime soon. So researchers are turning to other solutions, and they're easier to implement than you might think. One option is to change what cows eat. Right now, the average cow mainly eats fibers like hay or grass, and they can do that thanks to their complex four-part stomachs, which are great at breaking down tough starches. But those stomachs are also the problem. When a cow swallows hay, it ends up in their first stomach chamber called the rumen. There, microbes get to work fermenting those fibers and preparing them for digestion. The issue is that fermentation releases a bunch of hydrogen and carbon dioxide, and then other microbes turn those compounds into methane gas, which the cow then burps or breathes out. Over the years, scientists have tried to find food or supplements that reduce the amount of methane those microbes make, and they've explored explored everything from corn to various oils. But one promising option seems to be seaweed. It's not clear exactly why this works, but scientists think some components in certain types of seaweed can interfere with one of the catalysts involved in methane production. People have been looking into this for a pretty long time, but a study published in 2019 demonstrated just how effective it can be. In it, 12 dairy cows were randomly assigned to three groups. All cows ate some hay, but one group's diet consisted of one 1% seaweed, a second group of 0.5% seaweed, and the third group got no seaweed. Over several trials, each of which lasted three weeks, the cows ate their fancy meals and breathalyzers were used to measure how much methane they were exhaling. And the results were more dramatic than you would think. The cows that received half a percent seaweed yielded about 20% less methane, and the 1% group yielded about 43% less for 1% seaweed. Still, even though the trial went well, there were some side effects. Like, the cows were fine, but they did release way more hydrogen and carbon dioxide than usual. And that makes sense, because those compounds would normally combine to form methane. But they are greenhouse gases, they're just not as potent as methane, so that's something we should keep in mind. Also, this solution probably would not be cheap. Some expense is to be expected, of course. After all, nobody said that reducing greenhouse gas emissions would require zero sacrifices. But then there's the bigger problem. Where do you get all that seaweed? There are more than a billion cows on Earth, so even if we wanted to scale this up a little, that's still millions of kilograms of seaweed to grow, and that's not something anyone has really tried to do. So scientists are trying to find some other options, and they might have found a pretty cool one. Instead of changing a cow's diet, you go straight to the source and change their gut microbes. In a big paper published in Science Advances in 2019, researchers studied more than a thousand cows, analyzing both their DNA and the genetic material of the microbes in their digestive system. Now, as expected, not every animal had exactly the same microbes. About 500 of them were shared among 50% of the animals. Some of those 500 seemed to be involved with the cow's methane production, and many of them were at least somewhat heritable. In other words, they were passed from cow to cow through the generations. So, if you know which microbes cause cows to make methane, and you know that they're heritable, well, the researchers proposed you could breed cows to produce less methane. Alternatively, since that breeding would take time and we need climate solutions like yesterday, it might be possible to use a probiotic to change a cow's microbiome after birth. The biggest benefit to this would be that you get to ditch the fancy diets. The cow 
cars would be exhaling less methane all by their bad selves. The lower methane emissions isn't exactly a moneymaker as far as cow treats are concerned. The animals are usually bred for things like size or milk production, so for this to take off, the cattle industry might need some kind of encouragement. At the end of the day, it's important to remember that neither of these solutions by themselves will fix climate change or even cows' contributions to it. To really make an impact, we're going to have to combine things like this. And honestly, we'll have to combine it with eating less meat, which is a really effective option as well for those who can make that choice. But the thing is, climate change is a big, complicated problem, and one we will have to approach from dozens, if not hundreds, of angles. So when people work to find and implement real solutions like these, there are real reasons to get excited. Now, like I said earlier, cows can eat grass, which on second thought is not that incredible. But hey, who am I to talk? I can't eat grass at all. And here's why not. Cows really do have it made. I mean, basically everywhere they look, there's grass for them to eat. We humans don't have it as easy. You could try eating grass, but it wouldn't do much for you. So what's the difference? If cows can digest grass, why can't we? Well, cows have the tools to digest the cellulose in grass, but we don't. Our digestive systems just aren't equipped for it. Cellulose is a complex carbohydrate that consists of long chains of glucose units. It makes up plant cell walls, which is why it's found in basically all plants, like spinach, kale, and grass. Most of the plants we eat do also have some nutrients we can digest, but grass is basically all cellulose, and that cellulose is really hard to break down. Well, unless you're an animal like a cow. When a cow munches on some grass, it travels down its esophagus and into its four-chambered stomach. And for every serving of grass, this actually happens more than once. After the grass gets digested a little, it passes into one of the stomach chambers called the reticulum, where it forms chunks called cud. And then the chunks are regurgitated. They're brought back up to the cow's mouth so the cow can grind them up a bit more and break down the food even further. Eventually, the cow swallows the food again, which makes its way back to the stomach. Sounds delicious. It's not just cows that do this. Other animals like sheep and goats regurgitate their food too. They're called ruminants. The main area of the stomach is the largest chamber of the four, the rumen. It's where the grass digesting magic happens. See, it's not actually the cow that's digesting the cellulose in the grass. It's the tiny microbes living inside the cow's rumen. These guys do their job without oxygen in a process known as anaerobic cellulose digestion. It involves two main steps, enzyme production and fermentation. In enzyme production, the microbes in the rumen secrete certain enzymes, like cellulase, which helps break down the cellulose. One of the main ways that's done is by hydrolyzing the cellulose, where a chemical reaction involving water breaks the cellulose up into smaller carbohydrates like glucose. But the enzymes are the real stars of the show, acting as catalysts that kickstart the reaction. From there, the leftover smaller carbohydrates are fermented, meaning they're metabolized and converted into fatty acids like acetic acid, the acid in vinegar, butyric acid, which is found in milk, and propionic acid, an acid that's often used as a food preservative. These later get absorbed as nutrients. After all that, the partially digested grass eventually reaches the abomasum, which is the acidic part of the stomach that's similar to ours. Here, the food is digested even more and eventually enters the cow's small and large intestines. So the main players in grass digestion are the microbes. Humans can't digest grass because we don't have those microbes to produce the enzymes we'd need to break down cellulose. We do have the enzymes to digest other carbohydrates, like starch and simple sugars, we're just missing the ones that digest cellulose. But what if you could just take some of the microbes that are in a cow's rumen and put them into your stomach and let them do their thing? That probably wouldn't work, because your stomach is way too acidic for the cellulose digesting process to happen. The pH of your stomach is normally around 1 to 3, which is very acidic. The pH of the rumen, where the grass digesting microbes live in cows, is closer to a more neutral 6 or 7. The microbes stop breaking down cellulose at a pH of 5.5 or lower, so putting them in your stomach wouldn't give you the ability to digest grass. But there are two other potential homes for these microbes, your small and large intestines, but neither is a good choice. The pH in your small intestine is much more neutral, but the microbes might try to compete with you for the nutrients in the digested food. And your large intestine wouldn't be able to absorb the nutrients from the grass, so putting microbes in it to break down cellulose wouldn't make much of a difference. Another option might be to just swallow some cellulase, like how people who are lactose intolerant can take a pill with a lactase enzyme which allows them to have dairy. But researchers haven't yet developed a practical method for extracting the enzymes that would allow you to digest grass. And even if they did, we don't know what effects it would have on your health. So as convenient as it would be to graze on your front lawn for dinner, it's probably best to leave the grass to the cows. Now in a cow's world, if it's good enough to eat once, it's good enough to bring it back and eat again. And they don't just recycle their food, they also recycle their pee. I mean, ultimately they're still recycling the same nutrients from their food, just after it's been processed a little more. But here's a slightly younger version of me to tell you how and why a cow would do a thing like that. 
Every day, you pee out a valuable resource — nitrogen. Your body uses nitrogen in everything from making amino acids to expanding blood vessels. But after processes like digestion, your body binds it up in urea, a compound we can't do much with, and it all goes swirling down the drain. In some ways, it's our loss, and it turns out that ruminants like sheep and cows really have us beat. Because they've evolved a way to recycle their urea so it ends up not in their urine, but in their spit. Overall, urea isn't a bad thing. It might steal some of our sweet, sweet nitrogen, but it also prevents us and other mammals from poisoning ourselves. You see, some processes, including normal protein digestion, produce ammonia, a toxin made of hydrogen and nitrogen. And if that ammonia built up in the body, it would keep brain cells from efficiently transporting potassium, which could end up causing severe brain damage or death. But instead, it gets shuttled off to liver cells, which turn it into urea. Then the urea eventually ends up in the bladder. Since we use nitrogen for so much, peeing out urea may seem like a waste. But for us humans, it's not all bad. While recycling urea would be great from a nutrient perspective, it would also leave us with a bunch of extra nitrogen that could turn into ammonia. Basically, the extra nitrogen could be nice, but we don't always have something to do with it. Cue the ruminants. Ammonia is dangerous for them, too, but they can and do recycle urea and the nitrogen in it, they just have something to do with it. They feel feed it to their gut microbes. The process starts like it does in humans, with ammonia getting turned into urea by the liver. Some of the urea goes into their urine, but some of it takes another journey into their bloodstream, and some of that urea ends up in their salivary glands. It might sound kind of gross, but it's not like they're directly peeing into their mouths. And I mean, if you want more nitrogen in your diet, swallowing it is as easy as it gets. As they swallow their food and saliva, the urea enters the rumen, the first chamber in their stomach. And there, it meets a bunch of microbes. That's where the party starts. Those microbes have enzymes that turn the urea into all kinds of useful things, like amino acids that the animal can use to run its body. This is called the protein regeneration cycle, or urea recycling, and it's kind of like an insurance policy. Even if ruminants don't eat enough nitrogen-rich foods, they have this backup system for getting the nutrients they need. Granted, the rumen microbes process nitrogen on the first pass through the gut, too. But some ruminants can recycle nitrogen around two full times, or more, before excreting it which is way more efficient than what we do. Today, researchers are learning how to alter this system to reduce the amount of nitrogen these animals excrete, since compounds like nitrous oxide in cow manure are greenhouse gases. But even if we can't learn how to make this work for us, it's an amazing adaptation for them. With a little help from their friends, they're getting more from their food than we ever could. Having a system to send pee back into your mouth seems a little unsanitary. But that would only be a problem if it made them sick. And when it comes to your health, there's an argument for pee over, say, cannibalism. Here's what happened when we fed cows to cows. Mad cow disease is the common name for a condition called bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or BSE. It's a progressive neurological disease that affects cows. And over time, it causes severe brain and nervous system damage, which eventually leads to trouble standing, walking, and changes in mood, like increased aggression and nervousness. The spongiform part of the name just means spongy, because the infection creates a bunch of holes in the cow's brain where its cells should be. The first two cases of BSE were identified in the UK in 1986, but it takes a really long time for symptoms to show up, so scientists think the first infections probably date back to the 70s. During the outbreak's peak in 1993, almost a thousand new cattle were infected each week. But that number has gone down dramatically since then. BSE is caused by a bizarre, self-replicating protein called a prion. Other pathogens like bacteria and viruses use DNA to make copies of themselves, but a prion is just a deformed version of a normal protein that's found in cell membranes. Sometimes those proteins can go rogue and get bent out of shape, but right now we don't totally understand how or why it happens. And when those proteins become prions, they can bind to other proteins like them and make them bend in the same way. And then those messed up prions corrupt even more proteins, and so on. Clumps of them collect and spread in the brain and nervous system, eventually causing brain damage. But that takes a while, so symptoms usually don't show up until years later. All of that is terrible, but how BSE got started is almost as horrifying. It probably happened because cattle were being fed ground-up meat and bones from sheep and other cows. 
Ugh. There's another prion disease in sheep called scrapie, and it's possible that scrapie prions may have jumped to cows through their food and caused this whole mess. But it's also possible BSE just showed up when a random protein folded the wrong way. No matter how it started, the cattle feed only made things worse, because after cows died of BSE, they were ground up and fed to healthy cows, so the disease kept going. Unfortunately, a version of the disease can infect people, too. The human version of BSE is called variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, or VCJD, and it's also caused by bent prions. We don't know for sure that it comes from eating infected cattle, but since they're both prion diseases and both outbreaks happened around the same time, most scientists think that's the case. Like with mad cow disease, the symptoms of VCJD can take years to show up, but once they do, things move pretty quickly. Brain degeneration happens in just a few months, with symptoms like trembling, dementia, trouble walking, and eventually a coma. Since no cure exists yet, patients usually die within a year. Worldwide, there have been about 230 cases of VCJD, CJD, and about 180 of those were in the UK. The rest were mainly in Europe, and there have been only four cases in the United States, but they were all picked up overseas. The rate at which people have been getting infected has gone way down since the 90s, but scientists will keep studying it because there are other kinds of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease not caused by cows. Before mad cow disease was a thing, we knew about CJD as a rare condition that could appear if a random protein went bad, usually through an inherited mutation or through medical procedures like transplants. Today, we keep the risk of very CJD low by giving cows safer food and making sure no nervous system tissue gets into our beef. And even though the risk is small, you also can't donate blood in the U.S. if you spent too much time in high-risk countries or got a blood transfusion in Europe, because there's a chance prions could be spread through blood too. Mainly, it's those new farming practices that have really helped get the disease under control. And in 2016, there were no new reports of BSE in cows in the UK for the first time since the outbreak started, which is both exciting and a relief. Also, because mad cow disease is transmitted through nervous system tissue, there's no evidence you can get it from milk or the meat used to make things like hamburgers and steak. So your roast beef is not out to get you, which is always good to know. While there aren't many new cases, we can't say for sure that mad cow disease is eradicated like we can say for the cattle plague. So here's how we got rid of that problem once and for all. Viruses are bags of genetic material that are caught between life and non-life. They need living cells to replicate and spread. Lots of them make us sick, like the flu, measles, or HIV. And as a species, we humans are getting better at preventing viral diseases. But eradication, or eliminating them completely, is much harder. We have done it before, though. The eradication of the deadly smallpox virus declared by the World Health Organization in 1980 is hailed as one of humanity's greatest achievements. And there's just one other time that humans kicked that viral butt, rinderpest, or cattle plague. Vaccines and global efforts beat this lethal virus for good, and we learned a lot along the way. But every virus presents a different challenge, so each one needs lots of research to come up with effective treatments. Rinderpest was a nasty livestock disease. Infected cattle had a high chance of dying, suffering from a mix of fever, diarrhea, and discharge from almost every orifice. All of those bodily fluids helped the virus spread, and it really spread. Originally from Asia, rinderpest slowly moved into Europe and then became an epidemic in Africa in the 1880s. In Ethiopia, rinderpest wiped out a third of the human population by killing the animals they depended on for food and transport. And it didn't go away. Rinderpest caused devastation across these three continents and fear everywhere else. Quarantine and basic hygiene strategies helped a little, but what we needed was a vaccine, a little dose of weakened virus to train cattle immune systems to recognize and attack the enemy. An early vaccine from the 1920s used a technique called serial passage, making a weakened form of rinderpest by growing the virus in multiple animals or cells in a lab. In this case, the scientist J.T. Edwards infected a different species so that the virus evolved to suit goats rather than cattle. If you then put this modified virus back into a cow, the cow's immune system can safely fight it and build up anti-rinderpest antibodies in case the normal virus comes along. But this method takes a long time, and researchers had to look after a whole herd of goats, which isn't practical for mass vaccination. Plus, sometimes the virus would partially revert back to its original form and still cause disease. By the 1950s, we knew how to grow cells in petri dishes, a technique known as tissue culture. Using time, luck, and serial passage in lab-grown calf kidney cells, vet scientist Walter Plowright developed a new rinderpest vaccine riddled with a bunch of weakening mutations. And, best part, no goats necessary. It worked more reliably, and rinderpest infection rates plummeted in the next 
next few decades. But without a cooperative global effort, bouts of rinderpest kept popping back up. It was like deadly whack-a-mole for cows. So in 1994, the Global Rinderpest Eradication Program was launched. Its mission to target rinderpest's major outposts, then destroy it completely. The program's success depended on science and society at local and international levels. Researchers studied how the virus worked and spread and used mathematical models for more strategic vaccination rather than trying to vaccinate as many cattle as possible. Animals were injected with a new heat-stable form of the vaccine, which didn't need to stay refrigerated. Outside the lab, local farmers were really involved in educating people about rinderpest. They made up a surveillance network to look out for new resurgences of the disease or confirm healthy areas. And in 2011, 10 years after the last recorded case, rinderpest was officially declared eradicated, at least in the wild, since some lab samples still exist. We learned a lot during our long but victorious battle against rinderpest, so why haven't we eliminated all viruses. Well, even though it was devastating, rinderpest was actually more of like an entry-level viral problem. Rinderpest mutated relatively slowly and didn't vary much between strains, so one vaccine fit all and immunity lasted a lifetime. Take influenza viruses for a comparison, which change their genetic material so much that new vaccines are made each year to keep up. Also, rinderpest's horrible symptoms were pretty obvious, making it easy to find outbreaks and isolate infected herds. Meanwhile, viruses like Zika can spread quietly through asymptomatic carriers, and other viruses like HIV lie low for years before taking their toll. These viruses are much harder to track. So rinderpest may be a thing of the past, but the world is still full of viruses and the future is unknown. As we've seen from HIV, Zika, and Ebola, new viruses can seemingly pop up out of nowhere and spread fast. When they do, the race is on to understand the virus's activity, strengths, and weaknesses so that we can find the best strategies to prevent infection and disease. And we are getting better at it, thanks to better technology and communication networks, but each virus still presents unique threats and challenges. With food, welfare, and lives at stake, we need to remember that science and global policy work hand in hand to stamp out deadly viruses for good. Compared to eradicating cattle plague, setting up your business on the cloud is a piece of cake. So thanks to Linode Cloud Computing for supporting this video. Linode provides cloud-based storage, software, analytics, and more to you or your company. Being cloud-based means that Linode's computing resources can help you accomplish your goals in minutes and on demand. And they're flexible, so you only pay for what you need and what you use with no hidden fees or extra gotchas. Linode makes cloud computing for small businesses more affordable and scalable if they grow larger. Linode will be there to grow with your business with award-winning professional customer service representatives on call 24-7, 365 days of the year. To check it out, click the link in the description or head to linode.com scishow. That link will give you a $100 60-day credit on a new Linode account. And once you've got your business up and running with Linode, you'll have time for that work barbecue you've been planning. And if you're looking for the best way to cook your plague-free steak, well, science has the answers. And here's a hint, it's not searing. Here's Michael to explain why searing meat is a delicious lie. We've all heard it somewhere that we should sear meat before we cook it to lock in the juices. Funnily enough, that reasoning is completely wrong, but you should still sear your steaks. This misconception has been around for a really long time, and it might have gotten some traction in the 1840s thanks to Eustace von Liebig, a German chemist who wrote about the benefits of searing meat in his book Researches on the Chemistry of Food. And we've actually known this to be untrue for a while. For example, it was debunked in research published back in 1974. The results of that study showed that searing actually causes meat to lose more moisture, not less. In a sample of 12 seared cuts of meat and 12 unseared control samples, the ones that got a blast of heat first lost slightly more moisture, around 3%. Similar experiments have been conducted over the years in the lab and in the kitchen with similar results. Some experiments have shown no difference in moisture loss, while in others, non-seared steaks stayed a bit more moist. Either way, there's not a huge difference in searing first versus not. It's pretty clear that it's not helping to keep a steak juicy. And honestly, if you look at the surface of a steak, you might notice that it doesn't look very leak-proof after it's been seared. These things do tend to sizzle. Muscle tissue contains long filaments called myofibrils. Heating damages these fibers and causes them to lose water over time. The extent of water loss varies, and temperature plays a big part. Higher temperatures contribute to higher moisture loss, especially above 60 degrees Celsius, which corresponds to about medium doneness. So if searing doesn't lock in juices, 
why do we find this myth so hard to let go? We might think that seared steaks are juicier because they taste better. We know that fat and flavor contribute to our subjective impression of juiciness. On top of that, browning meat leads to Meyer reactions, and they create a ton of flavor. The French chemist Louis Camille Maillard described the reactions in the early 1900s. A Maillard reaction sequence begins with the reaction of a sugar and an amino acid. After that, there are a bunch of different ways the reaction can proceed, depending on factors like temperature and pH. And it's not just one reaction. Many small chemical reactions are occurring at the same time, producing new flavors, smells, and creating the browning color we associate with cooking meat, as well as many other foods. So when meat is seared, the Maillard effect does create a bunch of tasty flavors, but it doesn't lock in juices. That might explain why this myth has had so much staying power. Searing might not do what we think it does, but it is a good idea. A delicious, delicious idea. Like I said, science has the secrets to cooking cow with all the flavors you want. Some of it has to do with the cow's biology, and other parts of the equation lie in their chemistry. So if you're looking to impress at the barbecue this summer, check out these science-backed tips for cooking cow. It's summertime for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, which means one thing barbecue season. This style of food prep is all about heat and flames, and how to control them for the tastiest meat or veggies. And just like your kitchen at home, there's plenty of overlap between a chemistry lab and your backyard barbecue. So here are five science-based hacks that you can use at home to step up your barbecue game. First things first, no matter which animal it comes from, that protein-rich slab of meat is muscle. And land-based animals have layers of connective tissue wrapping those tiny muscle fibers into bundles. And a type of connective tissue called paramecium wraps those bundles into larger bundles. This bundleception continues until it's no longer microscopic. You can even see the bundles if you look closely. But the way that the connective tissue wraps around muscle fibers determines the grain of the meat, or which direction those bundles point towards. Now, some cuts of meat, like skirt steak or flank, have a thicker, more easily visible grain. They have larger muscle bundles with lots of connective tissue compared to something like tenderloin. This makes them tougher to bite, which is where this tip comes in handy. Cutting at a 90-degree angle to the grain, as opposed to parallel with the grain, will result in a more tender bite in your mouth. How do we know? Well, tenderness is a hugely sought-after quality, so folks in the meat industry actually measure this. A procedure called the warner bratzler Shear Force Test was invented to objectively assess meat tenderness. You basically take a tube-shaped section of meat and put it under a mini guillotine, then measure how much force it takes to cut through the sample. This test mimics what we do with our teeth when we bite into a steak, so it's a pretty good standard for objectively measuring tenderness. Now, back in your backyard, by cutting perpendicular to the grain, you're separating the muscle into a cross-section, short muscle fibers separated by that structurally weak connective tissue. A 1985 study in Meat Science, which is a real peer-reviewed journal, showed that paramecium broke down much more readily than muscle fibers. So by cutting across the grain, you're letting the heavy butcher knife do the work of breaking down the muscle so your teeth don't have to. Now, most of the time, adding heat is a predictable experiment. The longer you cook something for, the hotter it becomes until it burns to a crisp. But something different happens when you slow cook meat on a barbecue. It's a phenomenon known as the barbecue stall. The internal temperature of the meat will climb for a while, but then level out, even though it's still over hot coals. And the internal temperature might stall for hours, leaving you to wonder if the gods of thermodynamics have somehow cursed your grill in particular. A few explanations have been offered, like maybe the heat energy is selectively melting the fat. Or that collagen, a protein in connective tissue, turns into liquid gelatin when temperatures get above 70 degrees Celsius. But stalling happens at an internal temperature around 60 to 70 degrees Celsius, too cool for collagen to gelatinize or for fat to melt. So a more likely hypothesis is that this leveling out is due to evaporative cooling. Water inside the meat evaporates and carries heat away, much like how sweat cools our skin on a hot day. Then once the meat dries out a bit, the internal temperature finally starts to rise again. Some researchers from Texas A&M University attempted to measure this a few years ago at a food-themed outreach event, where they measured the stall in real time. To do this, they compared the internal temperature of brisket wrapped in foil to totally exposed meat. And they found that meat without foil experienced a stall at 60 degrees for about two hours, but the foil-wrapped meat didn't. So they concluded that the foil prevented the evaporative cooling effect, so the meat continued to rise in temperature. And in 2011, a physicist performed an informal citizen science experiment where he took a chunk of beef fat and threw it in a smoker alongside a sponge filled with cellulose water. Fat is hydrophobic, meaning it doesn't store water like muscle does, so it shouldn't experience any stall from water evaporating. Sure enough, the sponge experienced a temperature stall comparable to a proper brisket. On the 
other hand, the fat heated up steadily and ended up as a glistening puddle on the bottom of the smoker. Now, when you think of marinades, you probably think of the good old immersion technique. Soaking the meat in some kind of salty, flavorful, or acidic liquid for a long period of time can do everything from adding flavor to tenderizing before meat hits the grill. But it's more complicated than that. Certain ingredients are better at certain jobs than others. Marinades like brine or soy sauce can be used as a tenderizer because of their high salt content. That's because salts are good at breaking down what are called myofibrillar proteins, namely actin and myosin. In a living animal, these filaments slide past each other to perform muscle contraction. But when muscle becomes meat, they're still complex interlocking structures. Luckily, the salts can unfold them. Specifically, the negative chloride ion in salt binds to the filaments and creates an electrostatic repulsion. While the filaments are usually tightly packaged, this repulsion spreads them apart and lets water molecules trickle into the newly opened areas. It's like using similar poles on two magnets to repel each other. But instead of magnets, you have similarly charged ions. This increases the space between strands of protein, which lets the muscle hold on to even more water. Now, sometimes you might choose acidic marinades like lime juice, lemon juice, or vinegar, which tenderize meat slightly differently. Marinades with a low pH do help break down some of that connective tissue and add flavor to the meat, but they don't increase the meat's ability to hold on to water. One solution, according to a 2007 review in the journal Applied Poultry Research, was to combine the water-retaining properties from salty marinades with more acidic solutions to get the best of both worlds. A final type of marinade involves using enzymes from fruits, like papain from papayas or bromelain from pineapples, to break down the connective tissue between muscle bundles. Now, as for how long you should marinate for, that's up to you. Researchers in 1999 found that chicken fillets experienced their biggest uptake in water during the first five minutes of marination, with much slower absorption in the half hour afterwards. But a study published in 2010 compared the effects of marinating time on servings of chicken and found that the best tasting fillets resulted from a three hour soak time, compared to 30, 60, or 120 minutes. So do you really need to marinate overnight? Well, you can see some benefit in just a few minutes, but you might notice more flavor after a longer soak. Look, we've all been there. Figuring out the delicate balance of exactly how many seconds in the microwave makes the difference between a burrito that's frozen in the middle versus one that tastes like rubber. And grill masters run into the same problem, just with really big slabs of meat. They want to end up with a brisket that's both tender and juicy, which is tricky. Meat needs to reach a certain temperature threshold for some of its tougher elements, like collagen, to break down. But crank up the heat too high and you'll lose more water, making it taste dry. Enter slow cooking, using low temperatures applied over multiple hours of cooking time to get exactly the right internal temperature. And that precision is necessary because different chemical events happen at different temperatures. By 50 degrees, you've already started denaturing some of the proteins in meat, like myosin. And between 60 and 70 degrees, the tough connective collagen starts to denature and become gelatin. But you want to stick to the lower end of that range because the enzyme that helps break down collagen is only active under 60 degrees. And that process takes its sweet time. A 2005 review found that it took more than six hours to see significant tenderization benefits from slow cooking. So the sweet spot seems to be an internal temperature around 60 degrees, and definitely not higher than 70. That way, the proteins that are tough to the bite have denatured, which tenderizes the meat, and meanwhile, it's lost as little moisture as possible. Even just a few degrees hotter, and you risk losing the benefits. Although increased temperatures will further denature collagen and turn it to gelatin, the meat overall starts to shrink as water is lost. That means the other proteins in the meat will start clumping together, making it tougher. Researchers in 1968 reported that as meat rose above 60 degrees Celsius, Celsius, the tenderness progressively decreased. Basically, the extra breakdown of collagen can't compensate for the toughness caused by the other proteins condensing. This is why slow cooking is desirable. There's little room for error when you're aiming for the best balance between juiciness and tenderness. You need to hit a super precise temperature target, and slow cooking makes that easier to do. Other than keeping you from burning your mouth, allowing barbecued meat to rest for a few minutes after taking it off the grill will actually help it retain moisture. Usually that means taking meat off the grill and subjecting it to less intense heat before slicing into it. During cooking, some of the proteins, including actin, myosin, and collagen, shrink together, which decreases the amount of space available for water to hang out. Think of any time you may have overcooked a chicken breast. It probably shriveled up and dried out. Now, at certain temperatures, the proteins shrink irreversibly. Contrary to the popular belief behind resting, these proteins don't get their structure back if they cool down. Once they're heated up, they stay in that misfolded shape. But other mechanisms 
can reabsorb some of the water that's been squeezed out. It's been hypothesized that capillary action, the phenomenon where water moves through thin columns on its own, could play a role. On paper, the spaces between muscle filaments could pull up a column of water up to 300 meters, if you could find a slab of meat that big. But it hasn't been investigated specifically in reference to the resting effect. But a lot of water stays outside of the filaments, so regardless of how long you rest the meat, you still can't hold on to all of it. Unfortunately, there's no universal law for how long you should rest the meat, but as a general rule, the larger the roast, the longer you wait. So the next time your friends are laughing at you for claiming science can enhance your barbecue, show them the light with your flawless brisket. All it takes is a little understanding of the chemistry of protein, fat, water, and salt. Well, thanks for learning about cows with me, from burps to beef. And if you'd like to share your cattle curiosities with a young animal lover, you can watch our SciShow Kids video all about cows.